Hey guys, welcome to another study session. I'm Wave Nunley, Bible Unplugged, and we really appreciate you spending a little time with us today feasting around the riches of God's Word. We have been in a session, a series, where we're discussing Hebrew words that are used quite often in the Bible, words that you might be somewhat familiar with. And we've also been trying to, in building up our Hebrew vocabulary, we've also been looking at some of the names of God that show up in Scripture. And in doing so, trying to bring some uh, encouragement and some just spiritual vitality and strength into our lives as a result of encountering this stuff in the Scriptures. Today, we're going to be looking at a relatively unique name for God, El Gibor, because those gurus that do all the Names of God series on video and YouTube don't usually deal with this one. Well, that's one of the reasons why we're going to, because we go off-road more often than we go on-road. And we want to get the fullness of the riches of God's Word and not just cherry-pick the major ones. So today, we're going to be looking at, in Hebrew, El Gibor, in English transliteration, that basically means God the warrior. Uh, interesting, uh, maybe even startling to some, but just watch what happens as we process through the material. We have looked at names for God like Sar Shalom or Prince of Peace. We did a session on Jehovah Jireh or in Hebrew, Adonai Yireh, the Lord who provides or sees. We did one just recently, Ruach HaEmet, that comes out of the Dead Sea Scroll community, shows up in John 14, 15, and 16, the Spirit of Truth. And then today, we're going to be looking at El Gibor, El Gibor in transliteration, and the process of discovery, the excitement of discovery awaits us on this. The major passage that we're going to be dealing with, looking at, and then referring back to over and over is Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Never cited in the New Testament, but constantly referred to uh, in Christian preaching and teaching as referring to Jesus the Messiah. For us, to us a child will be born, a son will be given, the government will rest on his shoulders, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, there in the Hebrew, it's El Gibor. Again, if you could take your mental pictures, the word Gibor, because we're going to be using that. Even if you don't read Hebrew, you need to take a mental picture of this word. El, we all know, El Shaddai, El Elyon, etc., means God. And this word Gibor, which we're going to be looking at carefully to let context determine meaning. El Gibor eternal father and this Sar Shalom or Prince of Peace, which we have dealt with previously. So here's a question. When Isaiah 9, 6, in reference to the Messiah, calls him El Gibor, what exactly does that mean? So we're going to break this down into its two component parts, mighty or warrior, uh, well, let's look at some real-life situations described in the Hebrew Bible referring to human beings that use this word. First one we're going to look at is Judges chapter 6 in reference to Gideon the judge, the deliverer of Israel. The angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said to him, Yahweh, that's all capitals, always going to be Yahweh lying behind that, Yahweh is with you. You, O valiant warrior, and in Hebrew, it's gibor hechayil, and the, that, that word gibor, referring to a human being that is a mighty man of war. So that's where we're getting this idea of warrior. Does it go beyond Gideon? Yes, it does. When we get to Judges 11, and we're dealing with a judge whose name is Jephthah, in Hebrew, Yiftach, it's now Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a valiant warrior. Again, Gibor Chayil, okay? Gibor, Gibor, and this mighty God that we have back in Isaiah 9, 6, Gibor. It's the same word. So Gideon is described as a mighty warrior. Jephthah is described with the same word as a mighty warrior. And now watch, we're going to give you one more. 
and we're going to have to let that suffice for discussing the use of gibor in reference to humans, take a look at 1 Samuel 16, and this has to do with David, uh, not yet king, but would become King David. Then one of the young men answered Saul and said, Behold, I've seen a son of Jesse, uh, the Bethlehemite, who is a skillful musician. He is a mighty man of valor, a warrior. Now let's take a look at what it's, what it's doing in Hebrew. He is, a, he is a mighty man and he is a warrior. So we have two different phrases. We have one sort of modifying the other. Gibor Chayil, that's that same language that we got back up here and up here. Gibor Hechayil, Gibor Chayil, and Gibor Chayil. Um, a, a, a warrior of valor, a warrior of, of extreme bravery. We're talking here, guys, SEAL Team 6. We're talking here Green Berets. We're talking the baddest of the baddest of the bad, that's the way that this language, this Gibor Chayil, is being used to describe Gideon, Jephthah, and now um, David, not yet king. Gibor Chayil, and then it says even further, the Ish Milchama, a, and a man of war. So, man of war is modifying Gibor Chayil, uh, or uh, valiant warrior. Uh, all of this should be building up within us an understanding of contextually how these words are used in Scripture. Now that we've looked at this in reference to human beings, let's look at some more startling material in reference to God Himself. It says, the Lord, Yahweh, will go forth, and I've, uh, I've put this in the um, kind of the, the format of uh, poetic parallelism so that you're able to see that easily. He will, he will, he will, he will, he will. He will go forth, he will arouse, he will utter, he will raise, he will prevail. Hopefully that you're getting and appreciating that, that poetic parallelism aspect of Hebraic speech. Yahweh will go forth as a warrior. There you go. Ka Chayil, or ka, ka Gibor, as a Gibor or as a warrior. In the same way that Gideon, in the same way that Jephthah, in the same way that David, and lots of other people are described in the Hebrew Bible as being men of war, mighty men of valor. Yahweh is going to go forth as a Gibor. Think Isaiah 9 6. Um, God the warrior, El Gibor, usually translated mighty God, but God the warrior. He will arouse his zeal as a man of war. There's that Ish Milchama, that same phrase used to describe, to modify, that we saw in reference to King David, to David before becoming king. And watch what he does. He's going to be zealous. He's going to shout a war cry. He is going to prevail against his enemies. This is not a wimpy, sissy kind of retreating God that has to hide and be propped up by uh, statues and by our own rhetoric and that kind of thing. This is an active God who um, takes initiative, is mighty in battle, mighty in war, and goes forth and brings victory. That's the God that Isaiah 9-6 is talking about, and that is the God that you serve today still. So uh, this comes from Isaiah chapter 42. Couldn't get it up here because of the formatting. Anyway, Zephaniah. Yeah, Zephaniah, yep. A at the end of the Hebrew Bible, we've got a number of small books by prophets. It's still in the Bible. This guy is still as divinely inspired as the Apostle John or the Apostle Peter. Uh, this is God's Word. So if we have to go off-road to follow the evidence, that's what we're going to do. Why is that? Because I don't sit around in my mother's un um, uh, basement in my underwear or my um, pajamas and scribble weird stuff on pieces of paper that are supposed to decode uh, secret meanings in the Bible based on the numerical value of letters. We don't do that here. God's Word is straightforward. 
He expects us to understand it and follow Him. And so we are going to follow the evidence that is very main and plain and clear in the Bible. Thank you very much. So yes, Zephaniah, the the Word of God goes there. We're going there in pursuit of God's Word. So Zephaniah says, Yahweh your God is in your midst. This is the way Pharaoh used to go out with his armies because he wanted his armies to know that he was present with them and his presence was going to assure them of ultimate victory. So Yahweh your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. In Hebrew, a gibor yoshia. Um, that has the the root there, yasha, same word that uh, makes up the, the name Jesus. And it means deliverance, salvation, being uh, bringing, bringing a state of savedness, delivering people from their oppression, their enemies, their struggles and difficulties. A victorious warrior, and he will exult over you with joy. This is what happens when the battle is over and when there is the victory celebration going on afterward. He will exult over you. He is a victorious warrior. This is the reason why this kind of attitude toward God as being an active, you know, a, a, a taker of initiative kind of God in the Hebrew Bible. This is the reason why Moses is able to say in the book of Exodus, Yahweh is a warrior. He is an ish milchama. Literally, he is a man of war. The Lord, or Yahweh, is his name. This business of God being a mighty warrior, an ish milchama, is so intimately connected to his nature that what Moses is saying is this is his name. He is Ishmilchama. That is one of God's names. Ishmilchama we saw earlier with respect to David is simply modifying or amplifying this idea of Gibor, Edness, uh, the, um, the SEAL Team 6, the Green Beret, the baddest of the bad kind of thing when we're dealing with God. So we take all that back into Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. A child is born, the government will be on his shoulders, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, El Gibor, Mighty God, the God who goes into battle, defeats the enemy, and then rejoices over all those that he has has, um, delivered, brought salvation to, because they are now in a state of blessedness rather than oppression. Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So we've dealt with the mighty part, the the dealing with this aspect of the warrior God, the God who takes initiative, who goes into the battle on the front lines and, and, and does battle to defeat the enemy and to bring his people into a state of deliverance. Now let's deal with this business of God. Remember, mighty God. So we're dealing with Isaiah 9, 6, mighty God, prince of peace, etc. Take a look at Isaiah himself. Isaiah is the one who wrote chapter 9. Well, now we're just going to go to the very next chapter in chapter 10, and Isaiah has more to say about this El Gibor. He says, a remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, that's the people of Israel, to the mighty God. They're going to come back to the God of their forefathers. So if it's This El Gibor, or in Hebrew, El Gibor, to the mighty God, if that's in reference to God Almighty, yod Hey vav Hey, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, then, and, and that's true here in Isaiah 10, it's also going to be true back in Isaiah 9 when it talks about El Gibor. The rabbis in ancient times were saying that this Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, is in reference to the, um, the king in the Bible that is called Hezekiah. That's a real problem, though, because Isaiah, using the same language in just one chapter later, is using this language in very clear reference to the God of Jacob to whom Israel or the people, the the descendants of Jacob, are going to return in repentance back to not Hezekiah, but rather God himself. A really clear reference to um, to, uh, the God of Israel, not to some later king of Israel. So 
Isaiah chapter 10 continues, and now we're beginning to get context. It's going to come about in that day that the remnant of Israel, the house of Jacob, will never again rely on someone in human form, but they're going to rely on Yahweh. A remnant is going to return the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. Again, El Gibor. Um, And so this is giving us more data, more information, more context. We're building up perspective on this language used in Scripture, El Gibor, God Almighty or um, Mighty God or however you get it translated in your English, but the Hebrew behind it, El Gibor, God the Warrior. Let's take a look at some other passages. We've looked at Isaiah and how Isaiah uses it in chapter 9, and in the same way he uses it in chapter 10. Now let's look further. Let's look more broadly at Scripture, because there are about a half a dozen instances in the Hebrew Bible that use this phrase, El Gibor, in one form or another. Deuteronomy, we go all the way back to the law, or the the Torah of Moses. Take a look at what Moses says. For the Yahweh your God is, and listen to this because it just cascades down to where we get to El Gibor. He is the God of gods. He reigns over all of the false gods, all the pagan gods. Um, he is the God of gods. He is the Lord of all lords. He's, he rules over all human um, uh, leadership or rulership as well. He is the great. He is Ha'el Hagadol. He is the great God. He is the mighty God. He is Ha'el Hagibor, God the warrior, the, the, the awesome one who leads and brings victory in battle. He is the Gibor, and he is the awesome. Now, I know that we use that word a whole lot today, probably use it too much or, or, or overuse it, this word awesome. But what it means in Hebrew, let this fix and correct forever how you read the Bible in terms of this word awesome. Awesome is not a word like, man, that was really awesome. Like that was really cool. You know, that was really off the hook. That was really neat. Hey, I really enjoyed that. This is not what, when the Bible says awesome describing God, it is definitely not, those words in English are not descriptive of what the Hebrew is trying to say. So don't interpret ancient words in light of modern usage. The Hebrew is really clear. It's Ha'el, the God, Ha'norah. And the root behind this, this phrase, Ha'norah, the, that's the definite article, is uh, you have to shorten that to a yod, yod resh aleph. It means the fearful God, the one who, who, uh, who evokes a sense of, uh, of being completely undone, of, of being fearful, being in dread even. He is the, the, the awesome, the fearful, the dreadful one. He is the one who is to be respected and feared. We are to stand in awe of Him, in awe of Him. Uh, and He is a God who does not show part. Watch this, how this modifies this awesome, biblically speaking, this one who evokes fear or dread or being awestruck in us. He is not a God who shows partiality. He treats us complete with complete equity. Nor does he take a bribe. You cannot buy this God, this El Gibor, this God who is Hanorah, the awesome. Can't buy him off. Can't bribe him away from doing what is right and, tr- and true. Watch how Deuteronomy 10 continues to amplify this, the, the, the nature of this God described as El Gibor, God the warrior. He executes judgment. He shows His love by giving stuff that we need. He is a good God. So for this reason, we're supposed to uh, show love to people who are not like us, people who are not from our people group, etc. We're to show love for the alien because we were once upon a time aliens in Egypt and God took care of us despite. So in verse 20, Moses, this is Deuteronomy 10, 
Moses circles back to this idea of, and so you shall fear the Lord your God. It's not, we, it, he's not saying you need to stand up and just in, in, the, in, in the community of faith, declare how, quote, awesome, how neat or how cool God is. You shall stand in reverence of him. You shall be awestruck by him. Sometimes, yes, even you shall stand in dread of what he is capable of. That is El Gibor. That is God who can wax on, wax off, uh, to borrow a phrase from uh, Karate Kid parts one through seven or whatever. But you shall fear, notice the, sa the same root, Yod Resh Aleph, the root Yara, to fear, to stand in dread of, to stand in utter respect and appreciation for. You shall serve him and cling to him, swear by his name. He is your praise. He is your God, this El Gibor that we're talking about, this, this Hanorah, this one who is uh, fearful or dreadful in his nature. He has done these great and awesome things. And that is yet another example of, if you take away the prefix and the definite article, you've got that root Yod Resh Aleph, the root Yara. He is Hanorah. Uh, uh, hanor, he does these nor, uh, hanorot ha'ele, these great and mighty, awesome, fear-evoking, dread-expressing kinds of things. We stand in awe of what he is capable of. These are the things that your very eyes have seen. Your fathers went down as 70 people into Egypt and God multiplied them miraculously. That's what El Gibor is capable of. All of this is modifying that term used, that phrase used for God, El Gibor. He is mighty in action, and because of that, his names reflect that mighty in action. Let's move to the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, O you, um, God, who show loving kindness to thousands, so capable of, uh, of forgiveness, capable of compassion, expressing patience with us, but he does also re repay the iniquities of the fathers. And, O oh, great and mighty God. So again, we have this Ha'el Ha'gadol Ha'gibor. El Gibor, God the warrior. The Lord of hosts is his name. At some point, probably this week in a, in a short video, we're going to be discussing this phrase, the Lord of hosts. It doesn't mean people who have um, read all of Emily Post's books or pay close attention to how you're supposed to invite guests in your home and treat them when they are there as visitors. This phrase, Adonai Tzvaot, is Yahweh of armies in Hebrew. When you go to Tzava in um, Israel today, like Tzvaot, when you go to Tzava, that means that you leave your secular occupation and you go and you serve in the military. It's a word for army. So Tzava, singular, Tzvaot, plural, Yahweh of armies. So we'll connect that on a short later on uh, this week. But it's connected to the Yahweh of armies and this El Gibor, God the warrior. Do you see the connection of context and the power, the function of context? One phrase informs the other just the same way that we use language communication today. All right, Jeremiah continues in chapter 32. This, this El Gibor, as he's spoken in verse 18, is great. He is gadol. He is, he is great in counsel. That's that Eitzah. We heard in Isaiah chapter 9 that he is Pele yo Eitz, same root, wonderful in counsel. So all of these things are in, interestingly connected, not by some weird, you know, quirk of numerology or some kind of uh, presto changeo magic, but by the nature of language that God chose to communicate his nature to us. It's much more simple, much more straightforward than that. How are words used? How do they function in real sentence kinds of contexts? Great in counsel mighty indeed. His eyes are open, so he sees everything. He's got a great view of the battlefield. He knows who the enemy is. He knows who the friendlies are, and he knows how to bring deliverance to his people. He 
is able to do signs and wonders. Remember, he's great and he's to be dreaded or feared or highly respected, that kind of thing. Signs and wonders so that he's done such amazing things. You have made a name for yourself. This is a God of reputation. He's not some Johnny come lately. He's not some unknown. He's got a great resume of constantly being true to his promises and faithful to his people and his covenant with them. I'm going to take another a look at one other passage, the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is leading the people in a prayer of repentance. And in the middle of that prayer of repentance, he's addressing God directly. Now, therefore, O our God, the great, the mighty, there's your phrase right there, and the awesome God, all the way from, from Deuteronomy, 1400 BC, to Isaiah in the, or rather to Nehemiah in the 500s, early 400s BC, You've got about a thousand years of people using this same terminology that tracks back to Deuteronomy chapter 10, back to the Torah of Moses or the law of Moses. Great, mighty, and awesome. It's the same phrase. Ha'el, ha'gadol, ha'gibor. There's your word again. And if you took your visual image picture, you know that that's the same word. I'm not doing sleight of hand up here. I am giving you the original good stuff. You're getting the pure and unadulterated word of God here. The, the God, the great, the um, warrior, and the feared or dreaded or highly respected, Hanorah. Uh, and there I've given you uh, the um, translation or kind of a rough translation there. Who keeps covenant and covenant loyalty. So this is a good God that keeps his word and that is so powerful Uh, that he's able to overcome any obstacle to getting the blessings of that covenant into our lives today. Now, um, this is the reason why saints in the Bible, people that loved God and followed him in the Bible, like David here, when he's going out to meet Goliath, he said, you know what, you're coming at me with sword, spear, and shield, you know, all of the greatest weaponry of, of our day. You know what I'm coming to you with? He doesn't say with a shepherd's stick. He doesn't say with a sling, and he doesn't say with a bag of rocks. He says, I'm coming to you in the name of Yahweh of hosts, because he says, because the battle is the Lord's. Notice the connection between the, the, the heavy-duty conflict the major obstacle to people living in joy, in peace, in security, that, that the battle is standing between them and uh, those wonderful attribute aspects of God's blessing. Uh, David is saying here, the battle belongs not to me. It doesn't belong to you either. It's not about how well you've cursed me. It is the battle is Yahweh's. It's that kind of attitude. David knew El Gibor. David knew that this was not a God who retreated, retired, and hid somewhere in the Holy of Holies, but he's out there leading the charge on the front lines in the battlefield and has all the power to see that thing through to its end. It's the, it is, this is the reason why we get this in the New Testament. Here's uh, a, um, some poetry that was uttered by Mary, the mother of Jesus. And by the way, right after she was visited by Gabriel. That's Giboriel. That's the warrior of God. So who does um, God send to Mary in Nazareth to announce that she is going to give birth to the chosen one, to the Messiah? It is Gabriel. It is the warrior of God, angel sent to Mary. So what does she say? For the mighty one has done great things. There it is again. New Testament, we've, we've flipped pages and we're into the Gospel of Luke, but it's the same kind of stuff. Where is she getting this? Her Bible, the Hebrew Bible. What do you suppose she said for the mighty one? How would she have said that? I can be assured, to, uh, uh, I can assure you that it was because El Gibor has done great things for me and holy is his name. It, that's not even in question. We know what Mary said, even in her native language, first century Jews, land of Israel, in the, land, uh, in the uh, Hebrew language. Because El, B El Gibor has done great things for me. His mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who, check that out, fear him, the one who is Hanorah, 
the one who is respected, feared, held in dread, um, who feared, who fear him. He has done mighty things. Again, there's that reference back to this business of El Gibor, mighty, uh, mighty warrior, etc. cetera. Uh, this is the world that Jesus grew up in. This is his parentage. This is his heritage from a child up. Not surprising then that when he begins his messianic ministry and he's teaching his students, he says, pray like this. Don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And that's just kind of the conclusion of the Lord's prayer. And as a benediction at the end, he says, for yours is the kingdom you reign and rule. The government will be on his shoulders and the power, the authority, the might uh, that goes, that tracks back to this idea of El Gibor. Oh yes, you better know that Jesus knew this aspect of his heavenly father. The, yours is the, is the power, the authority, the might. And it's not surprising then that these same disciples that Jesus taught that Lord's prayer to would say on the day of Pentecost, there in the presence of the multitudes who had come to the feast, in the presence of the temple itself and all of its priests and leaders, these guys would say, they, this is what's said of them. We hear them in our own tongues, the multitude said, speaking of the mighty deeds of God. That's these guys, Mary, Jesus, his immediate disciples, they knew this El Gibor. You know what the beauty of it is? because we've jumped through all these hoops and you've hung in there with me. You've learned a little bit of Hebrew on the way. You now also know the glory, the majesty, the awesomeness in its original meaning, meaning it's the respect, the, the dread, the fear of this God who is called El Gibor. I want to encourage and challenge you with this. I want to encourage you to walk in this. He goes before you in battle. He's got a full view of the battlefield. He knows every weapon. He knows everything that's going on. He knows the need that you have for to be brought through that battle in victory, to, to be delivered into a, a place of safety and security and peace and joy. This El Gibor knows all about that. And he is so mighty, so powerful, SEAL Team 6, Green Beret, that he is able to bring you through no matter what battle you are facing. I want to encourage you, go in the strength of knowing that about your God and feel free to pray to him, to cry out to him when you're in the midst of the battle. Feel free to call out to El Gibor. He is the mighty God. He is the warrior God who fights for us. God bless you richly. Have an awesome week serving and representing him. 